This is the first episode in a series of conversations we're going to have about different kinds of Christians who sell Jesus. So we're going to be discussing different profiles of people who sell Jesus in different ways. These profiles are already available to read over at sellingjesus.org. If you click on learn and then you click on Christians who sell Jesus. The intention is to paint real-world scenarios of people who actively are engaging in the Jesus trade, given evaluation, and then we'll have a roundtable discussion of practical applications. So here is our first person, Joe the author. Joe is a gifted author who writes books to help churches be healthier. He has valuable biblical teaching to share, and he genuinely wants to serve the body of Christ. Since he has friends in high places, he's been able to get his books published by a large and influential Christian publishing house. He's happy that the publisher only charges $14.99 for each of his paperbacks and $9.99 for the ebook versions. They pay him a dollar royalty for each sale. When people ask him about how much he makes from his books, he's always quick to say that he's not in it for the money. And the small kickback he gets doesn't even cover the amount of time each book takes him to write. The fact that he's losing money in the sense that his profits don't equal the value of his time makes him feel good that he's making a sacrifice for the kingdom of God. Although Joe is well-meaning and sincere and willing to sacrifice time and money to build up God's church, he has been deceived in several ways. First, he wrongly assumes that scripture allows the sale of ministry. What he's doing is clearly Christian ministry, and both Jesus and Paul make it crystal clear through their lived example and teaching that ministry should never be sold, but it should definitely be supported by the free generosity of God's people. Second, Joe wrongly believes that the only way Christian writers can care for their families and stay out of poverty is by putting price tags on their books. The Bible and church history are full of examples of servants of God who were provided for through the free giving of his people to do ministry, or who worked a secular job like making tents in order to pay the bills. Third, Joe has been deceived by promises of renown and acclaim if he publishes with a big name publisher. Although he knows that he could distribute his book for free online digitally, and self-publish a paper version without receiving any profit, the lure of being perceived as a legitimate or real author because of the imprint of a well-known publisher prevailed. However, he covers up this desire for prestige by telling himself that a big publisher will reach more people. This may or may not be so, since he has never tried the alternative, but it doesn't matter. God does not measure success in numbers of copies distributed, but rather in obedience. And obedience would mean giving his writing away and supporting his ability to write by some other means than selling it. Joe is unintentionally living the lie that reaching more people with his writing is more important than obeying God. For him, the ends justify the means. So he's already observed that he's not making a lot. And that's one of the the bizarre things about this commercialized Christianity, this world that we live in, is that people are willing to trade Jesus for money for so little. Proverbs 28, 21 says that for a piece of bread, a man will do wrong. The payback is so little. It would be so easy just to forgo that small amount. But let's say it is actually something that he relies on. He could call on the support of others. It could be his church that helps him out. It could be other churches that help him out. It could be various supporters from online. There's a lot of tools that exist like Patreon. So there's a lot of options. Right. And I just want to reiterate, there are so many people 
who are not making enough money to live on from writing books. And that is the standard across the board in the entire industry of being an author. Everybody tells you, you should never be an author to make money, to actually live on, right? The standard expectation of an author should be to receive just enough to kind of have a, a tiny bonus, you know, of some extra spending money, but never to actually have it as a full career that they could dedicate all their time to. That's a luxury very, very few authors ever achieve. So I think a lot of other authors, even though they, they know that is the real expectation, if they're going to be realistic, they settle for that, for the prestige. So I think a lot of a lot of the time, these authors are, they're more happy with the pride of having a big publisher name on their book, even more than getting money for it. Um, same, same with journal articles and stuff like that, you know. It's just the prestige. Journals often or usually don't pay you, and sometimes you have to pay the journal to publish your stuff, and it's just the prestige, right? Getting that uh, ego boost that I'm published by this well-known entity. And I think that's even more sad when you're not only giving up the right to to be able to live on, you know, as the scripture says that the the worker deserves his wages. You're giving that up and you're and then you're selling Jesus just for the sake of your pride, right? You're turning over the the work that you've you've done for Christ to be controlled and sold by an entity just so that you can have that entity stamped on your book or whatever. And that's that's pretty tragic. And I think another fear that people will have is that no one's going to read their book or their work. And that's also a reason why they go with a publisher. What would you say to that as an author yourself? Yeah, well, once again, like, fear is a, a horrible master, horrible way to live by <laughs> as your, your driving reason for things. And so, yeah, I mean, if, if you trust God so little that you don't believe that people will be blessed by your book, if you don't follow the, the status quo, then that, that's a little sad. Um, but I understand that that's a real thing. So I, I would say the cost of obedience sometimes is, is going to be obscurity, maybe for a while, maybe forever, and that's okay. I mean, there's so many people in Christian history, right? I was just reading about a guy the other day dedicated 29 years to textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible that nobody knows who he is. His Wikipedia page is very, very short. And just Christian history is full of those kinds of people, right? The faithfulness, faithfulness is not guaranteed to get you a, a big name. And it's a, it's a very strange motivation to have because, you know, basically what you're saying is that I want people to read my book. And that will make me feel good to know that people are reading it. But, why, you know, you don't want people to read your book just for the sake of reading it. You want them to be blessed by it. And so, you know, if someone's going to be yeah. blessed by your book or blessed by whatever topic it is, then if it's good, it's, it's probably going to get shared around. Whereas, you know, if it's not that great or if, if it's just not relevant, why do you want someone to read it? Like they could be reading something else that could be more useful for their spiritual life. Exactly. And it may not, God may not have it, have planned to bless people with it in your lifetime, right? Isn't that the case with so many authors that we see who basically died in relative obscurity and then now they're, they're massive hits. It really is just a matter of walking by faith and submitting all of your, your things to the Lord. And you're, you're just, called to be obedient, do your work, and he can control how it goes viral or not and all of that stuff. It's way out of our hands at the end of the day. We can do all kinds of social media engineering, optimization of all these sorts of things, even pay thousands and thousands of dollars to hype it and get it out there. And at the end of the day, there may be some obscure, horrible book that outsells it. <laughs> I think that a lot of what you're saying really does rest on being convinced that this is obedience. You know, what we're describing is giving freely because we have been given freely. A lot of people, I think, come to this, hear these things, and they were already sort of leaning toward the direction of this would be better, but they're not necessarily at a position to say this is right and the other position is wrong. And so if you're really only thinking of it at that level, right you're not going to be 
too persuaded by the idea that, you know, trust the Lord, he will ensure that this works out for the best because you're still thinking about it pragmatically. Really what's needed is not a pragmatic evaluation that says, yeah, giving is probably better in most cases, or it's slightly more faithful or something like that, but it really is what is required. And we can trust the Lord to, we can trust the Lord to do good. Yeah. Another proverb, Proverbs eleven twenty four says, one gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds what is right only to become poor. Yeah. And I think it's important to highlight that we were arguing first, like from scripture for this. And then after that, I would say we, we can talk all day about pragmatic, practical, even economic arguments of why this is wise and good. And then third, we can talk about emotional arguments. Those All of those arguments are in place and we can talk about them. But what we're trying to do is be careful to highlight first and foremost the scriptural basis for everything that we're asserting here or arguing for here because at the end of the day that's what should be the last word right so if we were to go to the second tier of that into the practical arguments then yeah i think the fear of not getting your book out is many times a misplaced fear because giving it away for free is many, many times more powerful, especially if it is a good book, is many times more powerful than the alternative for going to many people and getting to, to many people's hands. And you can read books on that. I'm reading a couple of books right now. Uh, one is called Free, The Future of a Radical Price. These are secular books that are arguing for giving things away from just a worldview that's non-Christian, but the pragmatics they have seen work, especially in a digital age, work many times much more effectively than the standard model that we see. Yeah, and it's so bizarre that um, occasionally people come back and say we're in a different era now, implying that for some reason it's okay to sell things now, but it wasn't back then. But it's the complete opposite. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's never never been easier to give for free than in all history than it is today. Yeah. So back to Joe, I would just end on a very practical note, you know, if you were asking me, okay, so what do I do? What do I put as the, on the copyright page of my book? First of all, let's start with that, you know, so I, I want to give this away. Uh, what do I put there? I, all I've ever seen is all rights reserved, standard stuff. So yeah, what do, what do I do? Well, you can look at what we've done with the site, uh, what we've done with the book, The Dorian Principle, and some of your books, Andrew, that you've gone back and updated the covers on, which is to include a a Creative Commons zero notice on there, which is uh, dedication to the public domain so that people can know that the author has handed this over to the public domain. It can be used freely by anyone. Right. And I'll just give an example. This is a real testimony from a guy I've been talking to recently. And so there's no real hard and fast rules about this exactly. This guy, he chose to put Creative Commons 0, 2023, and by, you know, his name. And then he said, this work is freely given. All of this publication may be shared, translated, sold, and copied freely without limitation and without permission. To learn more about this open license, click on the linked badge below or visit copy.church slash free. The badge that he put there is this freely given badge that says public domain under it, which is provided on copy.church by John, uh, which is a, a really nice little kind of logo thing that you can put in your publications to make it clear and also to link back to a page that will explain in more detail to people who have a doubt about the license. You know, maybe this wasn't meant to be a huge conversation about licensing, but it is an issue with authors, right? We have to talk about this. And maybe, maybe John, you could jump in here. You probably have a lot to say about this to yeah, add. Yeah, sure. So the thing to realize about um, copyright and what you're doing with your work is that copyright's automatic. So you, you own your work and the exact text you put on that isn't about what legal trouble you'll get into. It's about freeing it up for other people so they don't have to worry about legal issues. So you don't have to worry about making a mistake on your work because it's not going to affect you, but it does affect other people. And so the key thing you want to do is make sure that it's clear what license applies to it. And so that's why it's really important to either um, put the URL 
to uh, copyright church or to the creative commons public domain dedication or at the very least if it's for example an image that you're sharing around putting that creative commons to cc0 which is a, a trademark and so people if there's ever a a legal issue people will know that refers to that particular license so it's all about making sure other people feel confident to be able to share it and they're not going to get in trouble so you don't have to hire a lawyer it's really simple to do you can just follow the instructions on the site let me ask you this john why would it not be sufficient just to say this is in the public domain and leave it at that yeah so it's not sufficient because every single country has different Uh, laws to do with copyright. There is an international agreement, but even that is um, subject to the laws of individual countries. And so because the legal landscape is so complex, um, thankfully, a secular organization called Creative Commons put a lot of hard work into creating this public domain dedication that, that covers all of the edge cases, covers all of the basis so that everyone in almost every country with 99.9% certainty can feel confident in freely sharing something and that they're not going to get in trouble for it. So that's why it's important not to do it yourself um, because people have already put in a lot of hard work analyzing all the laws in all the countries to come up with something that works everywhere. Yeah. And another point of confusion that people like Joe, the author, might have is where do I sign up for this license? How do I get it? Do I need to pay for it to get a Creative Commons license? Do I have to go register it somewhere? This is a question I get constantly from people because there's really a lot of confusion about that. They're like, oh, do I need to to go and, and create an account with them or something? And the answer is no, you don't have to do any of that. It's just you write Creative Commons Zero on your book and then you're done. You don't have to register or fill out forms or anything. It's pretty simple. Couldn't be easier. And the other thing I'll, I'll just throw out there to you guys, if I were Joe the author, I would probably ask, so why is it important for me to put a license at all? Why can't I just not put copyright? Why not? I'll just leave that page totally blank. Is that okay? Yeah, no, because copyright's automatic. So, right. and this is the thing that we really need to, because of the culture, the societies we live in, we really need to have a, a Christian culture of sticking a public domain, little just copy and paste, stick a little public domain dedication on every single thing you make because it's automatically copyrighted. And so if you make a little Bible study, just a short page for your youth group or your small group, then that's automatically copyrighted. And so you've got to get into the habit of just sticking that little thing on every single thing you make so that the people in your group can then copy that study and share it with others and not have to keep going back and finding the original author to ask permission. Right. And I would also tell Joe, like, it's really important to be clear because if you leave ambiguity around what you're sharing, then people will, because because there has been so much threatening and posturing and uh, fear-mongering around everything to do with this whole world of copyright and rights, and people are by default just afraid that like they they're like oh it's not clear there might be some loophole here I won't touch it then, but if you are really really clear and articulate about what how you're giving it away, that helps everybody. That's going to be what really helps launch it out into the world and and get it into people more people's hands yeah and we we come across these issues all the time as we try to gain ministry resources i remember a bible translation that thought it was a good idea to put a clause that people can freely share the bible translation scripture as long as they hold a certain theological view about the inspiration of scripture which sounds might sound great initially but then when you think about it that that basically means that non-christians can't share scripture with their friends and say, hey, look at this. This is a cool story about, this is a cool parable from Jesus. Can't do it because you don't hold the (laughs) belief about the inspiration of scripture. So Mm. please don't put any legal clauses or conditions when you're sharing. You can Mm -hmm. suggest what you'd like people to do, but please don't make any other requirements because it causes big legal headaches. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the next step for Joe would be, okay, how am I going to deal with finances? How are people going to be able to donate towards my writing? How would you guys suggest? You've mentioned Patreon, John. He could start a nonprofit if he wanted to. Here's one thing that I'll, I'll throw out there. What do you guys think about? There, there really ought to be a ministry that could be like any kind of other ministry, nonprofit ministry that that takes members and is able to receive donations and, and direct them towards members. That's just for authors, right? So they don't have to start their own nonprofit or they don't have to deal with Patreon's fees and stuff like that, where they can be a, a licensed nonprofit to designate funds, tax deducted funds to different authors who become members of their organization. I think that would be a, a great excuse for a parachurch ministry to exist. What do you guys think about that? I think that's a great idea, and I would not be surprised if there were, weren't already several mm. of these. I know that there are some churches that allow other churches to be part of their 501c3, and then you know any, any donations that are marked for them, they send back to the other church. So uh, there's already this kind of structure going on with some organizations, yeah. and it makes sense that you could do that more generically for more parties as well. Conley, what do you think about the local church being the catalyst for that? as far as being able to receive as the nonprofit entity to receive tax deductible donations for a member of that church who's an author and and give that to him. Do you think that would put put too much of a strain on the local church administration to have to deal with that? Or what do you think? No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I do think that it's very sad that our current legal system and taxes are so complicated that you would even have to do these sorts of things. Right. <laughs> but no, that does that does sound reasonable. The only problem is if a church were to do that, they would in some senses be trailblazing and there might be questions of, well, how do we do mm. this right, etc. But I think if this became a common thing, it would just be kind of obvious how to do it. Yeah. And I mean, a big advantage of uh, again, a pragmatic reason, a big advantage of giving freely is that you avoid a lot of these tax issues. So if you are earning an income on your book, you're likely to need to pay tax on that, at least depending on your country. Whereas if you're giving it away for free, you don't have to worry about that. And also if it is just a donation that people give you. I know at least in Australia, that would probably be considered a hobby. So you don't have to pay tax on that. So it makes it a lot simpler. You don't have to run into all these legal issues if you do freely give. Yeah. And then I, I, I suppose in Australia, you can only have a hobby up to a certain annual income, right? And then, and then it, it yeah, crosses over be, into something else. Yeah, there would be else. some threshold there. Yeah. Right. So if your book mm -hmm. became really, really popular, but that's the thing, right? If you're... If your book is making millions of dollars, then you probably don't need the donations anymore. So <laughs> stop taking them. Right. You know, if you if you're taking donations to support your book, then you'd probably stop. You should stop receiving them before it gets out of the hobby stage and you're actually starting to make a profit. So, yeah, I guess that would be interesting to know what that threshold is. If that is a living wage for people or not, I guess it probably is in Australia. I mean, like like you were saying before, most authors don't rely on their royalties right. okay. to live. So yeah. I'm imagining pastors um, who's written or someone who's written like one or two books, not someone yeah. who's living off it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe let's let's say Joe wants to do this full time. Now, I I know that in the states you couldn't you couldn't make a living wage off of donations and. and and be out of the tax issues, but that's not a huge problem. I think the issue with tax deductible donations is where it gets more complicated. And there's this thing about the United States where people really, really like to have tax deductible on their donations for some reason, even though 99% of them will never actually get a tax deduction because of their donations. They never reach that threshold because <laughs> you have to give like, a lot of money uh, away. In in your experience, Conley, have you seen like the the same kind of attitude in the church and in, in, in just in evangelicalism in general that people are like, well, I want to give, but only as long as it's tax deductible. So I, I won't give to you directly through PayPal or something as a donation. I haven't personally seen that, but I'm also not trying to uh, get donations and, and that sort of way, you know, just through PayPal or whatever. So right. I don't know, maybe it is, maybe that yeah. is a common attitude. I have, I have had someone who asked if 
they wanted to donate to my ministry and they asked if it was tax deductible and I said no and so they they didn't give anything <laughs> so I mean if you are when you think about tax deductibility there's an angle to which it's okay but in in some respects people are doing it just to save money or just to right yeah selfish um, reasons yeah make sure they they have they're losing less money than <laughs> they want to it really shouldn't be something you should even think about I don't think when you're yeah. trying to support Christian ministry and there'll probably be a lot of Christian ministries that aren't yeah tax de- deductible at least in Australia um so yeah don't even think about it and if it is deductible great put it on your tax return but it shouldn't be something that you consider when you're thinking about supporting someone I agree like I could throw out there that if you really are trying to give as much as possible and you know that you could give more if you are able to deduct I, I understand Sure. Some of that mindset, because you could really be trying to maximize your giving and yeah, be trying to play all those games, which uh, they are games, unfortunately. But right. Right. yeah, uh, you know the saying, uh, don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All that just to say or to highlight that the the issue often becomes for Christian authors, how can I get under the umbrella of a tax deductible entity, right? So that I will be able to receive donations from the many people who won't give to me unless I am. I want to highlight that in the secular world, if you look on like the YouTubers out there and all these other people on Patreon who are doing a lot of hard work in different ways as creators, they're not thinking about that. And there are millions of non-Christian people out there who are totally willing to give to these creators on Patreon, even though it's not tax deductible, and they don't hesitate. So I, I think we should keep that in mind as believers. This is more of a stewardship conversation, I realize, but keep that in mind as, as believers, but also as, as creators or authors, you know, there is a whole ecosystem out there of people doing this this kind of thing through Patreon and other platforms who are receiving donations without even worrying about the tax deductible issue. And so it's possible. So, so Joe, so let's say, okay, he's got his Patreon set up. He's receiving donations. Now he's, he's freed up to write financially. He's figured out the copyright issue. Somebody comes to him and they say, well, what if, somebody because you've published it as public domain what if somebody comes along and takes it and claims it as their own and makes a bunch of money off of it and then sues you for using what they claim to be their own i'll I'll step on the sue part because it really annoys me um i'm and to clarify i'm not a lawyer but i'm fairly sure if you went to court over such a case where you were trying to claim ownership of something Regardless if it is public domain or if you didn't put any license on it, you'd still have to come up with the same evidence to show you own it. And so you would show like drafts, you would show uh, all the work, evidence of work you put into it so to prove that you own it. And so the license you put on it has nothing to do and would have no effect, I don't think, on court cases where you're trying to determine who owns something. So if you if you didn't put any license or didn't de- dedicate it to the public domain, and then someone came along and said, hey, that's my book. I own that. It would pretty much be the same same issue. And so you'd go to court and you'd show why you're the true owner and they're not. So, yeah, this I don't know where this comes from, but I, I'm pretty sure it's, it's just nonsense that sure. just because you put something in the public domain that someone's going to come along and claim it as their own. Yeah. Um, maybe they will, but it wouldn't be any harder to fight that case than if you didn't do that. Right. No one has done that with Shakespeare, even though that would be very lucrative. <laughs> and uh, you could name a, a bunch of other authors. Now, the final thing that I'll mention here is if I were Joe, I would say, okay, I'm, I'm with you guys to the point where I, I still have this big fear that people are going to take my work and either put their name on it or they're just going to publish it and make a bunch of money from it. And it just kills me to think of somebody making a bunch of money off of my book without asking me or getting my blessing or whatever. What do we say? <laughs> This is so common. I mean, so we got to address it. <laughs> yeah. What's your goal? You know, if your goal is to get the word out, then praise God that someone's right. doing it. 
And this was uh, a story I heard from from First Love Publications, the publisher that published my book, The Dorian Principle. This was a thought process they had gone through even before they read my book, where they were thinking about what if someone ends up publishing one of our books and making money off of it. We've got to think of the ways that we can stop that and prevent that from happening. And then they realize, wait, if someone does that, that's perfect. That's exactly <laughs> what we want, you know, uh, <laughs> that that more people read this book. So, you know, just like Paul says that we should rejoice whenever the gospel is preached, even if some do it insincerely. Exactly. Yeah, we should be we should be rejoicing even when someone is giving insincerely. And insincerely is a pretty important concept in here because the Bible does tie together sincerity and giving freely. Second Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity in the sight of God we speak in Christ. So, yeah, some people are, are publishing insincerely because they've got this ulterior motive, but if they do, so be it. You know, praise be to God that the word's getting out. And and that's such an easy one because it's a there's a direct, like you said, direct correlation in scripture of something this this very thing happening. Maybe not necessarily for money, but probably, probably for money, very likely that the gospel was being preached in different ways. And Paul was still rejoicing over that. One of the reasons, because he was not the author and source of the gospel, <laughs> right? I think as all of us as Christian authors, we should acknowledge and always be very aware that we are not the Holy Spirit. We are not the authors of the truth, the sources of the truth, and and it does not originate with us. We're just stewards of it. So, Joe now has the the issue of, okay, how do I print my book? People like print copies, you know? What am I going to do? Are there any publishers out there that will adhere to the Dorian principle in some way and and print it for me? How does that work? Well, I think something that we've skipped over is making digital copies available. Right. Right. So if you're worried about getting this into people's hands, uh, the first step is to make digital copies available in the era that we live in. Mm -hmm. That would be the first step. Now, if you've done that and you're thinking about how to make print copies available, there are several options. First of all, it's not as expensive as people imagine to do a bulk print. Some people have more money on hand than others, but uh, it does not cost extraordinary amounts of money to get a printer, especially if you're willing to uh, go through an international one to make a, a large uh, quantity mm. set of prints. But then, yeah, you can partner with others. Once again, as we've already said, there's the same ways of funding the authorship you can use to fund printing. And then another option that I will throw out there, which I think can muddy the waters, but is a legitimate option, is using print on demand. Because at that point, uh, you've got some secular entity who is disentangled from your ministry, mm -hmm. who is charging for this service of printing arbitrary words. You know, so this would typically be something like CreateSpace, which is basically Amazon uh, printing your book for you. And this is how printing used to be done back during the time of the Reformation. You had religious authors not publishing for money, but they were writing just to get the word out there. And then the secular printers would be printing things for people for a fee. And they weren't doing this as a ministry. They were just printing whatever words, uh, you know, people, people wanted printed. So I, I do think that is a legitimate option, but I also think that it's cheap enough that it should be more of a last option for people. Interesting. So Martin Luther would be a prime example of what you're talking about, right? Where he right. received no kickbacks or royalties, just basically got into the hands of the secular publishers and they, they made their money off of it, got it out there. Right. And so it's kind of like what you were just talking about. You know, you throw some words out there and if people want to take them and sell them, you know, that's that's on them. Right. And so if you're if you're throwing your digital document into the hands of these, you know, secular printers who are yeah. willing to print whatever. They're not selling the gospel per se, right? They're doing this work of printing just whatever words right. people would have them print. So why would you say that it muddies the waters if you do print on demand? Like, how does it muddy the water? It muddies the waters because people may not realize that that's what's going on. They're used to the author and the publisher being entangled as a singular entity and... Mm -hmm. So really the goal 
in a lot of this is to communicate clearly that I have no ulterior motives. Uh, I am giving you this truly out of a desire to give you this truth. And right. you may fail to communicate in that way by using this means. And so that's that's why I opted not to go that route. Okay. But I think that we could imagine some future where that disentanglement is very clear, right? In fact, let's say there's tons of digital books out there. They're all in this very standard library. And there are all these secular publishers that are able to just grab that, you know, as a, just as a service that they provide. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I tell people, oh yeah, you can uh, purchase this off auto print if you want a print copy, people would know what I meant, you know, that it's this service that will print any of these sets of digital books that are available. Okay. And it's not me selling them the book. Right. Right. Yeah. And I know, I know one author who simply says that on his website, he has it for free online as a PDF. And if you want a printed copy, he just says, go here at publisher's cost. So he just says that, you know, this is pay whatever the, the printer is charging, but he, he makes it clear he doesn't earn any money from it. If I could chime in there, the problem I anticipate with that sort of situation is I imagine what has happened still is some kind of exclusive license so that only that publisher can print and then it's not really freely available. Uh, a lot of publishers aren't really willing to do the hard work of, uh, you know, either promoting the book or printing the book if they think that they're not going to have an exclusive ability to do that. And at that point, you've, you're not really offering it freely. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's why you shouldn't go with a, usually shouldn't go with a regular publisher. In my example, it was actually a print on demand thing. So it was Creative Commons, but yeah. So I'll, I'll share, well, first of all, publishing, like real publishers who do this, who adhere to the Dorian principle, we have first love publications, right? That's a real publisher you could go with, right, Conley? Right. That's right. Right. Um, so so let's, let's walk this through. Like if I'm Joe, I approach them. What is this process going to look like? Yeah, you would uh, email, I think it's info at firstloveministries.org, something like that, and uh, let them know what you have. They'd be able to review it and check it out. Of course, they're going to be more interested in publishing things in their circles. So if mm. they get emails without introductions, you may not get much traction. And these publishers that are willing to print freely, they are going to be generally smaller and not able to handle quite the same volume. Mm -hmm of emails that a, a larger publisher would, but Lord willing in the future, such free publishers will be more sizable. Right. So then after you're accepted by them, do, are they going to do a big print run and keep everything in their own warehouse? So what First Love Publications does is they have a, the kind, the style of machine you would use to print on demand. Okay. They have a partner who has one of those sorts of machines. So they do very nice. small batches. Now for, our book, what I did was our church funded the printing of it in bulk, not through the printer that they typically used. Mm. So that way uh, it could get the cost down much lower. I really wanted to distribute as many as possible. Right. I was hoping to you know, go higher than what their typical distribution rate was. And uh, we went that way. Do they distribute it for you, though? Yes, they distribute okay. it. So they it, keep it and they mail it out. Gotcha. Correct. Yeah, it funded and organized the printing. Right. Or our church did. So your church paid for the printing. Then who pays for the shipping? So First Love Publications pays for most of the shipping. They have not. They're trying to work on some deals with shippers to for international shipping. Mm -hmm. So for international shipping, they haven't quite sorted that out. And I really do want to get to get the book out internationally. So right now I'm I'm funding that. Okay. So just to be clear, First Love, if I understand right, they operate as a mission. So they operate on freely given donations from God's people. Right. It's a it's several churches partnering together, a few individuals giving, that kind of thing. Okay. They also accept donations on their website, I'm assuming, and all of that. That's correct. Okay. So is there any other organization that you know of that's doing exactly the same thing none come to mind at the moment so th that's maybe another another niche that needs to be filled more within the christian world people decide hey i i love typesetting i love the publishing world i'm gonna open myself up to receiving donations to start a ministry that just does this you know that serves authors 
that are, have valuable things to share and they want to abide by the Dorian principle. That, that would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, you know, any organization like that is going to have to ideally filter for quality and, you know, even theological orthodoxy. And so it's, it's a serious undertaking. Although I'll just add that even, um, you know, again, today, it's easier to do this kind of thing than any other generation. And almost everyone has a home printer. So uh, I recently printed the whole Bible as individual books. And so if you are, if you're writing a sizable book, it'll be more difficult. But if your book is either as long or short as Isaiah or Jeremiah, then you can print that at home. And so there are ways to format it into a booklet and people can print it themselves. And then they can highlight and scribble on it and write notes and not worry about messing it up. So yeah. <laughs> also, we, we have to contend with this culture that we've built up in the States and in the Western nations of liking premium products. You know, there's that issue. <laughs> Everybody wants the the really pretty book, but let's say, let's say you're Joe. Okay. You, you can't, you can't get first love ministries or, or something like that. Um, so I'll just share what I've done with my new book, praying the Bible together. I went through KDP. So you called it create space. It's, I think it's mainly known as KDP by Amazon now. So you can set up a free account. You go in there, you create your book. They have templates. If you don't want to use templates and you don't know how to use Photoshop to design your cover and you don't know how to, to typeset your book and stuff, there's lots of services that will do that for relatively cheap. You can even do that on like Fiverr.com, get somebody, a freelancer to typeset your book, make it look really nice, maybe even for as low as like 20 to 50 bucks and, and then you're good to go. And then you have a PDF that you upload and you upload the cover and then you can go in and you set everything down to the lowest price so that you basically make nothing or you make no profit. And then like John was mentioning, you could make that as explicit as possible inside the book, uh, on your website, etc. And I, I hope that most people will see that you're the price of your book is so significantly lower than other books that there's almost no way you could actually be making money off of it. Yeah, absolutely. And so on Kindle, it's difficult to make <laughs> to make books free. Basically, you have to publish it free elsewhere and then price match. And then you have to do that in every different region where the book can be purchased. And then sometimes they undo it for some reason, and then you have to go ask them to redo it. <laughs> I've, uh, Sarah, my wife, is just like constantly doing that for uh, the Dorian Principal book. Right. And and what my plan is to do someday soon is to make kind of a video tutorial and post it on YouTube and also on the website, sellingjesus.org, that kind of walks people through some of the different things, the tools that you can use to get your book self-published in a, you know, all of as, as premium quality as possible, and then to set all the things the right way. Because it, it can be confusing on, on KDP to figure out how to get it down to zero sometimes. And also, you know, have the, the right, find the right ebook aggregator so that it gets on the most platforms possible for free. So I use Smashwords, so did you, Conley. That's a good option. So it's free to, to put it on there and then it goes out. They send it out to a lot of different places that, that people can get it. Amazon is the kind of the oddball out that you have to really work hard to make it totally free and not just 99 cents. But it's possible with a little perseverance and it's worth it. Another practical tip, if anyone is planning on meticulously publishing this in the different places, you would want to do that first before you go to Smashwords to hit all the others because Smashwords will just automatically try publishing it everywhere, marking themselves as the publisher. And so you might end up in a situation where you're kind of stuck with uh, with this publication being everywhere with them as the publisher, whereas you had wanted to be the publisher. That was one thing I was dealing with when I'm trying to make First Love the publisher of this book as I'm putting it different places. Mm -hmm. And if you've gone all to the, the effort to create the PDF and the front cover and all the different assets you need to do a printed book, then please publish that as well so that, you know, someone else, you might not have the money, but maybe someone else will love the book and come along and say, hey, I want to do a print run for a thousand copies and give them away. And so then they might just do it themselves um, or they might do it in another country where it's hard to import or it costs a lot to import books. So publish the assets they need to print it themselves mm -hmm. as well. Amen. And another detail 
I almost forgot to mention is a step I think most authors leave out, and that is making your book available in a format that is easy to make derivatives from, to edit, to uh, manipulate in some way. So I'm thinking of all the authors who, yeah, they go that step of making it free, but they only post the PDF. And I've been guilty of that myself, where you even have it nice and formatted how you want it to appear, right? And then you're done, and, and then you don't post the Word doc or whatever you used that's that makes it more editable. And that's a crucial step, I would say, to encourage someone like Joe to do on your web on his website. Don't just have the PDF, have, don't just have the, the EPUB version, but also have the the Word doc or or whatever you used to typeset it in and make that freely available so that people can go in because when you copy and paste from a PDF, as everyone knows, you do not get the, the formatting right. You have all these headers that get mixed in and these page numbers that get mixed in. And it's a huge headache if somebody wanted to take that, for instance, and translate it and run it through Google Translate to make a draft and then clean mm -hmm. that up into another language. That's going to just make it, the footnotes are going to get all messed up as well. So don't forget that step. Yeah, that's good. I had every intention of doing that with mine and I've gotten busy and not actually done it. <laughs> and then on top of that, I have it all in a Git repository yeah. where I've also placed things like uh, the API keys so that I can talk to um, uh, first love oh, okay. publications and see how many orders there have been recently. And it's like, oh, well now I can't just easily open source the whole repo because <laughs> there's an API key in there. But uh, yeah, I, I'd start off with every intention to do that and still uh, would like to, but yeah, it'll take a take more than a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not done it with all of my books yet either. It's it's on the to do list. I I did it with my Divine Name book, and I think also with Praying the Bible. But yeah, it's it's just one of those easy things to forget. Be mainly because you know I'll I'll bring this back to we just have had basically no models, no no role models in this. Right, my role model was John Piper, as I've shared before, and how he gave things away on Desiring God Ministries. And it was always just the PDF. And so I thought, okay, well, that's the way everyone should do it, right? This is, this is what the the big boys are doing. But yeah, it's always a way to go go further. Yeah. And also the PDF is probably in letter format. So please don't do that for Australian printers, which are A4. <laughs> so every country is going to have a different page format. So yeah, PDF is not great. Yes. Think globally, please. Think Joe, Joe author Joe, think globally. Don't just think that everyone has the same kind of paper <laughs> that you do in the States. That is not true. And uh, until you've lived overseas, you do not understand how frustrating that can be and just how how much it affects so many things. So, yeah. And, and I've been guilty of that myself. Google Docs is another great option. You know, if you don't want to share a Word doc or something, uh, you don't use Word or whatever. You, Google Docs is a great universal format. You could paste it all in there. And, and make that publicly available for people to copy in. Because it's already in that format that is easy for them to Google Translate if they make their own copy from it. So there's there's just lots of advantages there. And that's what we do with freehebrew.online. All of our resources are in Google Docs. So people can easily make their own copy and then format it to their own paper size for their country. Just to go way back to the beginning of our conversation, something I forgot to mention is that even if you're just charging one dollar or one cent, um, it's a it's a paywall. So even doesn't matter how little the amount is, you're putting a paywall on your resource, and that's really bad for a lot of people in the world who don't have credit cards and don't have debit cards and have no means to pay that fee. So <laughs> a lot of the world's um, countries are still cash economies and they don't have a means to pay online like that. So yeah. yeah. And in secular psychology, they refer to this, this thing of just charging like a nominal fee or just one penny as a cognitive load that you place on the person. So it instantly changes their interaction with the product is as into a decision that they have to make of whether this is going to be worth it or not, worth putting in their credit card information and worth the penny or whatever, and the time that it takes to purchase it, it all of a sudden becomes a decision and people don't like making decisions. They're always trying to avoid as many decisions as possible in their lives because their lives are complicated and busy. And so when you put that there, 
you are immediately driving away many people who ca cannot handle that cognitive load at the moment and they don't want to decide whether it's worth their, their time or money. Just a little tidbit from secular psychology. There's books written on this. You know, lost people are thinking about these things, but Christians are not thinking about these things, either from a psychological standpoint or even from a biblical standpoint. And that's why we're here. And also in our world today, we're so concerned about privacy. So please don't require someone to give their email address either so I, at least for myself every time someone wants my email address it's a, a decision i have to make whether i want to give them that, that or not so yeah and it's just it, it again violates the principle of yeah. freely giving so we've talked about one how much longer can you guys go <laughs> yeah i never thought that we would go so far at one but i i kind of like how this went and i I'd, thought it was going to be uh five five or ten minutes on joe the author <laughs> We're just past an hour, Mark. 